her very, very hard work. Everyone in this room knows that if you need an army, an Alexandrian <coughs> army, to go out to Loudoun or Prince William, just talk to Dorothea Peters and she will send blue, we spread blue outside of Alexandria. Outside of, oh, thank you, thank you, Dorothea. So um, I will get to my guest of honor in, in just a minute. Um, I do want to thank uh, former governor, Terry McAuliffe, for coming here. It was a pleasure. I got to know Terry uh, really after I won my race and uh, got to know him in Richmond. I'll tell you a funny story about Terry and me that I thought was really funny. So I, I was in Richmond an entire year, and you know we worked together and worked on bills, and I, I um, sustained all his vetoes, which I know he appreciated. Um, and that was in 2016. And then uh, in June of 2016, there was a pride celebration at the governor's mansion. And so I go to the pride celebration, and I'm there, and Terry and I are talking. And he's like, so why are you here? <laughs> Terry, did any of your aides tell you I was gay? He's like, no, I, I, I didn't know. <laughs> Alexandria, it so doesn't matter that, of course, you have a gay delegate and a gay senator. Uh, but that's not why you elected us. You elected us to, to help you. And I'll tell you, um, this is, the name of today is Twas the Night Before Richmond. Literally tomorrow morning, I hop in my car. I'm going to pack tonight uh, and head to Richmond. And this is what's called the short session. So we're going to have seven weeks, a little bit less than seven weeks. It starts Wednesday, and that's it, just seven weeks I'm going to vote on a thousand bills in seven weeks. Wow. So I've got actually my aides here. Uh, my chief of staff, Jacob Weinberg, is in the back. Um, Jake, many of you know, was my campaign manager way back when. And I'm really glad to have him on board now. I miss Steve, but Jake is filling in nicely. And uh, many of you, when you need something, when you come to Richmond, or he's here around Alexandria, you need something in Alexandria, many of you will, will work through Jake. So it's good to put a, a face to, to the person you're working with. And then the new guy I got on staff right there is Snapper Tams. Snapper is a new law graduate. Um, is it your of Virginia? Is it? Richmond. Uh, University, University of Richmond. University of Richmond. Just, just graduated. So I have a legal counsel on staff, which is really cool to have. And then the third person is actually, she's filming me right now. Uh, Barry Fife, many of you know her. She is a native Alexandrian, born here, grew up here, and uh, was sort of my intern in high school. And now she's my aide. And she's coming from uh, William and Mary, and is going to come in two days a week. You're seeing, you're seeing my Richmond staff right here. Um, before I talk about my bills, I do want to recognize we have some elected officials in the room. I did not know we're coming, so it's a pleasure to see all of you here. We have Councilwoman Amy Jackson. We have Councilwoman Del Pepper, a fixture of Alexandria. And we have the Vice Mayor of Alexandria, Elizabeth Bennett Park. So thank you all three of you for coming. I didn't know you were coming, so that just makes it even better. It would be more of a privilege to have you all here. Um, I want to talk about um, my agenda. For uh, I have just uh, gone over my bills with Jake. I'm going to tell you what bills I'm going to introduce. And, but before I get to even that, I know all of you know. This fundraiser is not for me. It'll go to my campaign, and then assuming I have no opponent, which I really don't expect and I don't want, um, all of it will be shipped out. I'm gonna give every penny away. Because this is the year we have got to take the Virginia Generals. Yes. This year is critical. Um, you know how close we came in 2017. Uh, wonderful teacher at Newport News by the name of Shelley Simons, won her election by one vote. The Republicans conceded to her, and the next day they found a vote that they had said before they didn't need to find, and many of you know it was a tie. They picked the wrong name out of the bowl, and so in the House of Delegates, we are, we Democrats have only 49 out of 100 seats. And if you think 49 is really close to 51, you don't know math. They're, they're, they're hundreds of miles away from each other because 51 gives them the majority in everything. And that means that, for example, we Democrats put forward some 70 pieces of legislation on guns to have gun violence, really you know, background checks, modest measures, 
Every single legislation on guns was killed by the Republicans on a party line vote. Things on climate change, they, they killed that. My paid family medical leave bill, my minimum wage bill, uh, pretty much anything you care about, um, you know, they, they, they got rid of most of those. Now, uh, we did get a few things done with our 15 new freshman Democrats, the most important of which, of course, is Medicaid expansion. Very, very proud of you. Uh, starting this week, starting four days ago, 400,000 Virginians now have access to health care they didn't have it before, which right. is really <laughs> elections matter, the guy to my left, Governor McAuliffe, tried really, really hard to get Medicaid expansion. He worked really hard to do it, and it wasn't his fault. He didn't have the numbers in the legislature to do it. But with 49, that was, it's a big difference between 34 and 49, that was enough to get that through. We got that through. And think how much more we could do with 51. Yeah. So I, I want to thank everyone for donating tonight. If you can afford to give more, <laughs> please do. Uh, understanding that um, you got to get two credits for it because you get one from me, but you also give it to whether it's Wendy Goditis or Dan Helmer or Shelly Simons or any of them, Elizabeth Guzman, Jennifer Carol Floyd, whoever it is. In fact, you can even tell me and I will designate it to the person so you can make sure it gets to the right person. Uh, but then I get a little bit of credit for the caucus because I have my own fundraising goals. So I just really do appreciate that. Let me talk about my agenda. Um, I always, every year, do bills I think can pass and then bills that sort of send a message of what I want to do in the future. Um, two bills that I really hope will pass this year are, are things I've worked on in the past and I've come really, really close to. Uh, one is a bill to say that domestic violence should be considered in child custody. It's ridiculous that it's not. It's considered in some cases, uh, but it's only considered when it occurs within the family. Well, if someone has a history of domestic violence, they're not a good parent. And uh, many of you know my own story, my own history. This is something I've been fighting really hard for, and I think we can do that this year. Another bill, I'm always trying to look out for vulnerable people. Another bill allows people to visit their loved ones who have Alzheimer's or some kind of dementia. A constituent came to me and told me a really horrible story. Um, his love of uh, 14 years, I believe. Um, he can't see her anymore because she has Alzheimer's and the, the guard is keeping him away. And it seems to me that loved ones should be able to visit other loved ones. If there's abuse or something, it should be up to the guardian to try to keep them out rather than making family members pay a whole lawsuit, which they often can't afford. So I'm always trying to protect vulnerable people. In that regard, I've got three bills on protective orders. So again, I always think when it comes to sexual violence and domestic violence, these are the kinds of issues that can cross party lines. These are the kinds of things that I can work with Republicans. And I've had Republican support for this kind of legislation before. So I have three bills on protective orders. I have a bill that says if someone's in the hospital, they can um, apply for protective order via video phone or Skype if the judge allows it. Which, when you think about it, if someone's been really injured, to keep them away from the courthouse would be a really horrible thing to do. I have a bill to make it easier so the victim doesn't have to keep coming back and face the accuser. They could just come once for the criminal trial. And I have a third bill that basically makes sure that victim services counts for, for issues of domestic violence because the code isn't clear on that. So those three bills are sort of my protective order bills. Um, and then I have bills on transparency. Many of you know I am the co-founder of the Virginia Transparency Caucus. This is something I'm very proud of. I began it the second day of my freshman year. A lot of my fellow delegates were like, what are you doing, Mark? Uh, <laughs> but I do, I, this is, a, again, a bipartisan measure. I do it with a Tea Party senator, uh, Republican Amanda Chase. So it's bicameral and bipartisan. And we've already successfully brought cameras into the committee rooms. And so today, you never could do this in Virginia before. Today, you want to see why your bill died? You, get to, you can watch it live. It's archived. You can see exactly who spoke for it, who spoke against it, and what the final vote is. Because today, after our Transparency Caucus, every single subcommittee vote in Virginia is <laughs> farther. It shouldn't just be on the General Assembly. It should be on health care. I think you have a right to know how much your health care costs before you get it. And that seems yes. really obvious to me. If I go and order a steak in a restaurant, I look at the price and, okay, $20? Okay, fine. I'll have the steak. It's not like I get the steak and I eat it and they're like, oh, that was a really good steak. How much is that? $4,000. <laughs> 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 
No, it doesn't work like that, but healthcare often is like that, right? You go in for a non-emergency operation and um, they're like, well, you know, and then you, you, you get hit with the bill and it's fifty, sixty thousand dollars and and you know, healthcare costs bank are the cost the reason for eighty percent of bankruptcies in America. So you have a right to know how much it's gonna cost, and you have a right to know how much your drugs are gonna cost before you get the drugs. So you can say, well, you know what, I don't wanna pay under twenty dollars, I can get twenty dollars at good RX. So my goal will require healthcare providers to tell you the cost of healthcare. I have one on drugs and one on providers. I have another bill um, that's been asked for by uh, Governor Northam, by the agency, to um, disclose health-related infections. So that if, um, hospitals already have to do this, but if you get a health-related infection from an ambulatory surgery unit or a doctor, um, it already has to be reported to the federal government. Why shouldn't Virginia authorities know so they can help prevent infectious diseases? So those are the bills, those eight bills are bills that I think have at least a chance in a bipartisan environment. Mm -hmm. Then I've got some bills that will not pass, <laughs> but I will proudly put them forward. I have a bill I put forward in the past to allow localities to raise the minimum wage. We all know that the cost of living in Alexandria and Arlington is a lot higher than it is in Bristol or Abingdon, and why shouldn't localities be able to raise the minimum wage? Uh, you know, I thought Republicans believed in local government. Well, they don't, they're gonna kill this bill, but it's a very important message bill and then once we get a majority, I think this bill will pass. I have another bill that I really enjoy. It affects um, the presidential race, actually. I, I don't know why I looked at the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the moving moving Virginia? Um, no, 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 that's not the bill. The bill would help to get rid of the Electoral College. Yeah. <laughs> as anyone, I can't remember where I go, but I think that part of it, uh, Article 2, Section 2, really, really is outdated. Now, a lot of people would say, but Mark, you need a constitutional amendment to change that. You need two-thirds of the House and the Senate and three quarters of the states. That's never going to happen. You're never going to get Wyoming and Delaware to agree to that. We don't have to. There's a compact called the National Popular Vote Compact, and all we have to do is get enough states that have 270 electoral votes to make a deal among those states. And they can say, we will give our electoral vote to whoever wins the national popular vote. Now we don't need two-thirds of the House and the Senate. Now we don't need three-quarters of the states. 16, 17 states can do it. We already have about 160 electoral votes. California's done this. New York has done this. Illinois has done this. We can add Virginia to the mix. We get closer to 270. And we can finally get rid of a system that is archaic and undemocratic. I guarantee you. This bill will not pass this session, but, <laughs> but help me raise enough money to get enough 51 Democrats, and this bill can pass in 2020 just in time for the presidential race. Again, I don't know why. I'm not using my left. Um, I've got a couple other bills I think you'll find interesting that I think are more sort of message, message bills. Um, I've got a bill that says that uh, if you go to the cleaners, that they can charge you because something's difficult to clean but they can't charge you on the basis of your gender. Right. It's it? not fair to me <laughs> that women pay more than men for a lot of cleaners. So they're going to have to justify that something is tougher to clean. They can't just base it on gender. So uh, that actually also came to me from a constituent. I thought it was a great idea. Uh, a couple of other bills. I've got bills on police body cameras. I've got bills on animal cruelty. Uh, I'm trying to decide. I got the 15th bill. Which, you know, should I ban 3D guns, which won't pass, or should I do paid family medical leave, which won't pass? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure which I'll, I'll fill that last slot with. But um, I had five gun bills last year. None of them passed. I, I will tell you this though: if you work with people like Dorothea, if you'll contribute a lot more, if you'll help my colleagues, my vulnerable Democratic colleagues, and bring me some new ones, people like Shelley Simons and Josh Cole and Dan Helmer and give us 51, we will finally have sensible gun legislation in Virginia. Right. Let me just close by saying this. We have our 400th year of the House of Delegates this year. Oh, Chris, uh, I, I should have mentioned school board uh, a member uh, we have uh, as well, just joined them. Um, it's the 400th year, we are the oldest body, elected body in the Western Hemisphere. We're older than the United States Congress. We're older than the Senate. The Virginia Senate's only been around since 1776. And, you know, it's, it's, we were 160 years old before they got started. But we're having our 400th anniversary. 
2019, on our 400th anniversary, could be the first time in Virginia history to have a progressive majority, to have a progressive House and Senate and government. <laughs> People say, well, Democrats were in charge 20 years ago. That's true, but the Democrats, the 80s and 90s, they weren't all progressive Democrats. There was, some of that was the bird machine. It was a very different Democratic Party then. I would argue the last time we had a progressive majority in Virginia was during Reconstruction, and that didn't last very long. So this, we could have a permanent progressive majority, and so I know I've asked you to dig, but if you can dig deep and give a little bit more, or tell your friends who aren't here to give a little bit more, it's not for me. It is to change Virginia forever, and we can do it, and I want to thank everyone in this room for that. And now I want to introduce to you uh, the former governor of Virginia. He may run for some other office in the future. I don't know. Uh, I, I'll let you ask. We'll have a question and answer afterwards. You can ask him some tough questions. Terry McAuliffe, many of you have seen his charm and heard his speeches and seen him in public. I have to tell you, I've seen him in private. We've been drinking in the governor's mansion from time to time. We had one day, I remember, you had a bunch of people over. Everyone had a cigar except me. I don't smoke. Uh, but in private, He's just as charming and fun as he is in public. I gotta tell you that. He, he's the rare politician that doesn't really have so much a public face. And um, I really enjoyed just the two years I had with you, Governor. And I, whatever you decide to do next, I'm looking forward to it. And I present to you the former Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia, Terry. <laughs>